This lecture will cover child abuse. We'll talk about some of the definitions, characteristics, and effects. Okay, when we work with families about abuse and neglect, it's important to understand um, abuse, to be able to recognize it and understand what some of the precipitating factors are for families. Um, really mainly stress and kind of coping management. When families are very stressed out, they tend to be much more likely to be abusive. We're going to talk about some of the physical signs of abuse, behavioral signs of abuse, and signs of neglect. So physical abuse can be defined as, um, it's characterized by the infliction of physical injury as a result of punching, beating, kicking, biting, burning, shaking, or otherwise harming a child. It's important to note that the parent or caretaker may not have intended to hurt the child, rather the injury may have resulted from over-discipline or physical punishment. This happens a lot with physical abuse. One of my experiences was, was working with parents that were mandated to take parent education courses. That means they um, were ordered by the, the court to do that. And it was in order to get kind of education that they needed in order to um, maybe regain custody of their children or have um, less involvement of Child Protective Services um, in, in their family life because they had been identified. And one of the things that I heard a lot from parents is, you know, they, they would say, well, I didn't, it was a spanking, and then, you know, he, he wasn't doing what I wanted him to do, so I just, I spanked him harder, or I spanked him more, and it's like a spanking that got out of control and uh, turned into a beating. It's important to know that physical abuse can happen with people that you find, you know, otherwise lovely. Nobody wakes up in the morning and looks in the mirror and says, today I would like to beat my child. Um, what happens is that folks kind of wake up in the morning and they think, well, I, today I want the best for my child. And because of poor um, coping skills, very few um, tools in the toolbox in terms of how to discipline children, very poor understanding of what's developmentally appropriate. For, um, for children of a given age and stage, folks kind of lose, they, they lose control. They don't, have, um, they don't have the right skills. And that's why uh, when we work with parents who've been physically abusive, we really work with them on understanding, no, your 10-month-old did not throw the peas off the high chair tray to defy you. It's, that's what 10-month-olds do. And your 3-year-old um, didn't stop cleaning their room to be disobedient. Um, it's just that three-year-olds can't stick with a task for very long if they don't have someone continually redirecting them. And cleaning a room is a big job, kind of a lot for a three-year-old. So we definitely see this. And so I, I, I want to just point out that ch physical abuse can happen even when it's not necessarily intention to hurt the child, such as in shaken baby syndrome where um, folks shake an infant because the infant won't stop crying and so people shake the baby, and they're not trying to hurt the baby. They're trying to get the baby to stop crying. But even so, they're intending to shake the baby, and that shaking did result in hurting the baby. Now, you know, of course, this doesn't cover, you know, accidental, oh, I turned around, I didn't know my kid was behind me, I bumped into him, and he fell down and hurt his elbow. That's a different thing. Accidental injury is different than... Um, physical abuse, even when physical abuse is lacking the intention, because the intention to, let's say, shake the baby or strike the child was there. It's just that the parent may not have had an intention to leave a mark or to um, let that spanking go rogue and turn into a beating. Now, child neglect is characterized by a failure to provide for a child's basic needs. So I have four categories listed for you here. Um, one is physical neglect. That's the refusal of or delay in seeking health care, abandonment, expulsion from the home, refusal to allow a runaway to return home, and inadequate supervision. Although lack of supervision is also its own um, category. Sometimes it's separated out that way, too. Um, Educational neglect is allowance of chronic truancy, failure to enroll a child of mandatory school age in school, and failure to attend to a special education need. This doesn't refer to homeschooling. This refers to not schooling at all, not doing anything at all to um, 
allow a child to gain the skills that they need to make their way um, in the world. And failure to attend to a special education need is usually pretty dramatic. It's, it usually involves some kind of um, medical component or very kind of very severe educational needs. Nobody ever gets reported for educational neglect because um, the parents, you know, refused to have an IEP for their child that has a mild. Um, visual processing problem, but sometimes if you have a family that is um, all out refusing to deal with something that's very dramatic or pronounced, then um, looking at that aspect of it can really help, you know, identify families that might just even need a little bit more um, support or even help finding resources. Emotional neglect is includes a marked inattention to a child's needs for affection, refusal of or failure to provide needed psychological care, spousal abuse in the child's presence. Now this is new. In 2003 when we had a reauthorization of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act and it was renamed to the Keeping Children and Families Safe Act, they included a provision uh, about spousal abuse in the child's presence and said well that's actually a form of abuse. It's emotional um, abuse or emotional neglect. Either term is fine. Um, and, and previous to that, that wasn't classified as abuse. That was, oh, well, the, the, maybe the mom was abused, but it wasn't abuse for the child. But it is. It is abusive for a child to witness their um, parent being beaten. And permission of drug or alcohol use by the child, that's also um, a form of, of neglect, certainly. I had a student once disclose that she, um, when she was in high school, she was in uh, ninth grade, and she had a, a boyfriend, and her boyfriend's parents one day said, you know, we really like you, and so we want to show you how much we like you, so we have something for you. <clears throat> and she opened up the little present that they gave her, and it was a tablet of ecstasy. <laughs> and uh, that would be a pretty dramatic example of, you know, what not to do. Permission of drug or alcohol use by the child there, in, you know, not only enabling drug use but fostering it and um, to have that kind of wish for your child is is markedly unusual even amongst um, folks who struggle with addiction so um, emotional neglect that's a, a pretty important thing to think about and then lack of supervision is self-explanatory of course there's a developmental component to lack of supervision we would never dare leave a 10-month-old for as long as we could leave a 10-year-old, and we would never leave a 10-year-old as long as we could leave a 17-year-old. It's perfectly fine to leave a 17-year-old overnight if you have to go on a, you know, on a work trip or something, but you, you can't do that with a 10-year-old. So lack of supervision has developmental age requirements or components to it. But um, oftentimes children come to the attention of child welfare authorities because they're improperly supervised. You know, when you see a, a four-year-old running around at 10 o'clock at night by themselves, it, it gets people's attention. That That's the kind of thing that um, that folks would be reported. It, it's interesting, most child um, abuse and neglect cases are reported to Child Protective Services because of neglect and among that category it's lack of supervision. Most of the time that's the thing that people see. Sexual abuse, the definition is for you here. This includes fondling a child's genitals, intercourse, incest, rape, sodomy, exhibitionism, commercial exploitation through prostitution, or the production of pornographic materials. Many experts believe that sexual abuse is the most underreported form of child maltreatment because of the conspiracy or conspira um, the secrecy or conspiracy of silence that so often characterizes these cases. About a third of child sexual abuse cases occur with children under the age of six. Although the riskiest time in general is for girls between the ages of eight and twelve. Girls older than twelve um, are more difficult to um, groom for sexual abuse. That's, that's actually the term is called grooming when um, perpetrators are um, preparing a, a child to be abused. Um, and uh, most of the time it doesn't happen younger than 8, 8 to 12 is the risk factor, but about a third of the time it does happen to very young children, as I said, children under the age of 6. 
Now, emotional abuse, this is the most invisible form of abuse. Nobody ever shows up at the hospital, you know, at the hospital, the ER, and says, I've been humiliated. So it's really invisible, but it's terribly damaging. Emotional, psychological, verbal abuse, mental injury, by any name, it is a, a very damaging um, form of abuse. And the definition for this is as follows. Emotional abuse includes acts or omissions by the parents or other caregivers that have caused or could cause serious behavioral, cognitive, emotional, or mental disorders. In some cases of emotional abuse, the acts of parents or other caregivers alone without any harm evident in the child's behavior or condition are sufficient to warrant child protective services intervention. But that is rare. That's the kind of stuff where maybe somebody is locked in a dark closet for hours a day and they're not beaten but they're locked in the closet. That would be an example of emotional abuse that would be um, substantial enough that CPS might intervene, but only if they know about it. And the problem with emotional abuse is that victims are always made to feel that it is their fault, that, that whatever kind of abuse is occurring is occurring because they're bad and they're naughty and it's it's all their fault. And really because children do love their parents and 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 love does occur even in these abusive families. It's it, it may be hard to understand, but um, but families do love each other even when there's abuse taking place. So children will just tell themselves, well it Clearly it's me. It must be me. I just was very naughty. Um, but another example of emotional abuse where it's just straight up emotional abuse I read about in the paper a couple of years ago. There was a, um, a middle school boy who came to school and he was crying in his social studies class and um, a so, you know, a social studies teacher pulled him aside and said, well, what's going on? And he, you know, he didn't want to say, and he didn't want to say, and he, but he also couldn't pull himself together. And um, and so finally, he said, "Well, I got a bad grade on my test yesterday. I got a C, and so my mom um, told me that as punishment, I needed to go get the hammer and kill my guinea pig with the hammer." That's an example of psychological abuse and psychological abuse that's severe enough that Child Protective Services actually did intervene in that in that case and work with that family. Child Protective Services generally tries to keep families together by working with parents and kind of giving them coping skills and tools and other things. It's, um, it, it's, it's usually the last resort to remove a child uh, from their home. Okay, here are some physical indicators of physical child abuse. So we're going to look at behavioral indicators and physical indicators. And so first, we're looking at physical indicators. So the first one is unexplained bruises or welts that may be in various stages of healing and clusters or unusual patterns. They may be on several different areas of the body. Um, unexplained burns in the shape of a cigarette, rope, iron, or caused by immersion which may appear sock or glove-like. So if it looks like a child is wearing a red sock or a red glove, it means that their hand or their foot was um, put into that hot water and then held. And then, of course, when your skin is burnt, you take it out, it's all red, and it looks like you're wearing a red glove. Sometimes you may see on younger children a very funny pattern of burns where you've got burning kind of on the tops of the legs and... Um, you know, kind of all on the hips and a number of places on the legs, but there will be bare patches right behind the knees, um, on the on the bottom. There may be, um, on, you know, on the on the rear end, there may be a spot that's not really very burnt. And um, what happens there is if you take a child and put them in a tub of hot water and you know and the child is sitting what you instinctively do in that situation is you try to protect your body so then the area behind the knees won't be burnt because you're tucking your your knees kind of up to your chin and so where you've got your flesh touching your flesh that won't be burnt um, the rear end might not be burnt um, because if you're sitting on the bottom of the tub depending on what the tub is made out of you might not burn your bottom but um, you'll still kind of have these red areas all over your legs, and that's what immersion burns uh, tend to look like. Unexplained lacerations to mouth, lips, arms, legs, or torso. 
unexplained skeletal injuries, stiff swollen joints, multiple or spiral fractures. A spiral fracture is where a bone breaks and and it's almost, it's got like a spiral quality to it. Like think of um, putting a bottle cap on a bottle. It's, it's got, it's almost like a little bit of a spiral pattern. And that kind of um, break can only be caused by twisting. So if you grab somebody's arm and you're twisting and pulling them, that may result in a spiral fracture. If you grab a child's ankle as they're trying to run away from you and they're twisting, um, then that would cause a spiral fracture. But falling can't cause a spiral fracture. So you know that when there's a spiral fracture, there is the involvement of another human being holding on to part of your body in some way and moving it in a way that you didn't expect them to do so. So there's always an other human involvement in a spiral fracture. That just does not happen accidentally. Missing or loosened teeth, here's another one that has a lot to do with developmental age and stage. If you see a, you know, a 10-year-old with missing or loosened teeth, that 10-year-old has probably been punched in the mouth. But a 6-year-old with loosened teeth is just a 6-year-old with loosened teeth because that's, you know, they're popping their teeth out like popcorn at that age. It's very common. So we always have to think about the developmental age and stage of children human bite marks. Bald spots. Um, bald spots oftentimes are caused when somebody will grab you by the hair and drag you. That will cause bald spots. Also, sometimes they can be an indicator of abuse because some children who are um, being abused will engage in soothing behaviors like, gra like pulling their hair and even pulling it out of their head or kind of pulling on a spot of hair so much that it creates a bald spot. Either way, there's definitely something wrong when a child has a bald spot. Children do not have bald spots unless there's something amiss. Unexplained abrasions uh, and appearance of injuries after school absence, weekend, or vacation. Here's a chart that um, can, kind of shows you a diagram of the types of injuries that result um, from child's play and the types of injuries that are more suggestive of abuse. You can see that in the child on the left, bruises that usually result from children's play, these are kind of typical things. The top of the forehead, because the, you know your head is heavy, and so as you're falling, your head will tip forward. So if a child is not very skilled at putting their arms out, they'll generally hit their forehead first. We don't lead with our chin when we fall forward. We lead with our forehead. Um, the fronts of our arms uh, also are kind of a typical typical spot or our elbows and especially you know for falling and we're falling forward we might get you know scraped elbows and a scraped forehead that kind of thing or even the inside of our elbows just depending on if we're falling on something. Um, <clears throat> the insides of the knees and around the knee area, that's really common from child's play. Even if you're riding a bike and you tip over, um, that, that tends to be kind of the spot where, where you would hit pedals or where your knee might come up and hit, you know, a handlebar or even the seat might move and grab you kind of on the, on the inside of one knee. And the fronts of the shins, of course, we um, probably all as children remember banging the fronts of our shins. Those are very easy places to injure ourselves accidentally. Now on the right, we see bruises that seldom result from children's play. When something is in the nose and the mouth, that's um, oftentimes because a child has been struck. Now sometimes with toddlers, they may fall forward. If they fall onto an object, they might injure that area, but it's really, it's, it's just you know, it's it's more common um, that we would, again, unless we're falling onto an object, we lead with our forehead. So anything in the mouth and nose should definitely get your attention. Anything in the genital area, that, that does not usually occur from child's play. Even when you fall on a bike, the areas that you see there, um, the front of the um, legs and the groin area, that's generally not even where you injure yourself, even when you fall on a bike, because there's something about the falling motion where it kind of, the bike shifts a little and your body shifts a little and it's more on, it's more on your legs, or at least it's easily explained and there's certainly nothing on the front of your legs. So um, those types of bruises are indicative of abuse, usually. And um, the middle of the back, that's something that's caused when somebody strikes you. Um, 
from you know from behind often as children are running away and they're being kind of struck as they're running away that's where you would see something in the middle of the back or on the backs of the legs and then of course um, on the bottom so here are some behavioral indicators of physical child abuse easily frightened or fearful of adults and parents physical contact or of other children crying um, when children just seem kind of unusually frightened then that's um, that's an interesting thing to follow up on it's a behavioral indicator destructive to self and others I worked with a little girl once who used to peel the skin from the palm of her hands she had a lot of um, you know anxiety and that's how it would come out and some of these soothing behaviors that are self-destructive I worked um, at a psychiatric care facility and I had many children that I worked with that would do things like pull hair from their head or um, kind of chew their fingernails like way way down a lot of people bite their nails but when you chew them down to where you hardly have any nail that's uh, that's unusual so you know anything that you see and of course cutting and um, you know hitting hitting one's head against a wall anything like that self-destruction is um, as a sign. Extremes of behavior if a child is very ag aggressive or very withdrawn that gets your attention. Having poor social relationships. When a child is coping with abuse it's a lot to carry around. A lot of children um, become hypervigilant or maybe they even engage in um, some bullying because they're learning that being more powerful is what gets you what you want and abuse is definitely about power so even though children can't always articulate all of that they they do start acting some of it out sometimes it's a lot to manage if you're being abused and you're a child and sometimes it's hard to learn about George Washington's birthday or about your alphabet letters and so we do see learning problems like poor academic performance short attention span delayed language abuse creates um, it creates over time you know cognitive distortions and social emotional difficulties and so it, it would be hard to concentrate on academic tasks runaway or delinquent behavior reporting unbelievable reasons for injuries complaining of soreness or moving awkwardly being accident prone wearing clothing that is clearly meant to cover the body even when that clothing is not appropriate for the weather and being afraid to go home Okay, behaviors seen in neglected, in neglected children include um, some of these items. Social withdrawal and passivity with peers. Academic problems. Lack of persistence, initiative, and confidence to work independently. Eating issues such as hoarding food, gorging when food is available, failure to thrive, which is um, a term that we use for infants who are um, having difficulty um, being coaxed to eat. Soothing behaviors, I mentioned this in the last slide, rocking, head banging, scratching, cutting, and a lack of empathy. In some ways, neglected children have an even more difficult time than physically abused children because what happens with um, physical abuse is that there are these um, terrible episodes where the child is beaten, but then you know there's there's kind of a cycle there's sort of a mounting tension and then there's the episode of abuse and then there's kind of a lull and in that lull people do lots of stuff there can be you know a beating but then there are also trips to Dairy Queen and there can be a beating and there are also family vacations there may be a beating but there are also you know bedtime stories there may be a beating but there are also times that that the child and the parent have you know very pleasant conversations now with neglected children they get nothing oftentimes maybe a beating but sometimes not you know not even um, you know not not any kind of acknowledgement um, or attention and certainly a neglected child would not wish for a beating but um, neglected children do feel that no matter what they what they do kind of no one will notice well if you feel that whatever you do won't even be noticed it would be very hard to develop empathy and it would be very hard to feel that if you are persistent and work hard 
that you'll be successful because neglected children are kind of invisible. They learn that they don't matter at all. And if, if they don't matter, then why would following the rules matter? Why would um, sharing w toys with other people matter? Why would not robbing a bank matter? I mean, it, you, you know, lack of empathy is, um, it, you know, without that, I mean, that's what gives us our, our moral code in a lot of ways. And neglected children are oftentimes the worst off in terms of outcomes because they have learned that they don't matter at all. And so in the research, what we see is that we see that there are, you know, some many, many difficulties that are dealt with by um, victims of child physical abuse, but there are even, the kids who have been neglected are, are they're even worse off, actually. So it's a really hard issue. And you should know, actually, that the rate of fatality for neglect is the same as the rate of fatality for physical abuse. When we think of abuse and neglect, we, we have this image of, well, the children that die are probably the children that are beaten to death. But actually, um, just as many children die from neglect as die from um, those dramatic, um, horrible physical abuse stories that we, um, that we see sometimes. Um, you know, in the media or even around us. So here's what we need to think about. I've given you a little bit of information, a little synopsis on abuse and neglect. You have a module, also some um, a little training module that you need to complete for um, this component of the course also. And I want to just talk with you a little bit about your role in abuse and neglect. The first thing is you need to document your suspicions. And this is really hard because I have to tell you, folks think of abusers as being people that are jerks or rude or mean or, you know, that you can somehow tell in some way. It, it simply does not work that way. Abusers can be some of the most charming people in the world. They can be the same people that bring you an apple for the first day of school or are so nice to you or give their child a hug at pickup every day. It can happen um, to, you know, in, in families across socioeconomic levels, you know, it can happen in the, you know, in families where you think, oh, but, you know, that person's a doctor or a teacher or whatever. It can happen. So you need to document your suspicions. You have a legal responsibility to report abuse. I, I know someone. I have a friend who had, um, a suspicion of abuse and her director told her not to report it and you have a legal responsibility she had to report it anyway it's just unfortunate that it had to go kind of through a you know more of an anonymous reporting situation instead of having you know normally in a lot of centers and your you know where your place of employment will tell you this you bring it to a supervisor and the supervisor will usually make that call but if your supervisor refuses to make that call you still have a legal responsibility to report um, any of us that work in um, early childhood human services any kind of um, teaching role anything like that we are what what are called mandated reporters it means we are legally obligated to report examine your personal attitudes about abuse and neglect. Uh, it's hard. Uh, I think that the issue of spanking is particularly uh, tricky and difficult because some folks think, oh, spanking is no big deal. My parents spanked me. Spanking's fine. Other people think, oh, no, that should never happen. And, um, and it's really tricky, especially if you have that bad feeling in your stomach, like, oh, maybe if this child gets in trouble, they're going to um, potentially be um, spanked or be beaten and, and you don't necessarily know. Um, you've got to get familiar with what your own attitudes around discipline are because you need to know what it is that you think. If you know what it is that you think, then you will be more able to kind of cope with whatever crosses your, uh, your doorway. Create an atmosphere of trust with families, with kids, with other staff so that if you are wondering you you know you can kind of say well I don't know is this is this out of line I you know I I need help figuring this out and knowing your community resources that's really important part of this too might even be seeing a family that you think is terribly stressed out and you think gosh you know they're 
they're so stressed and they have so many needs, if you can help them find some of those things that they need, then maybe that will lower the stress level of the family and um, perhaps even mitigate some of the risk of, you know, bad things happening within that family. So this kind of gives you a synopsis of abuse and neglect and the most important thing that you should take away from this uh, podcast is that you should understand that you are a mandated reporter and that if at any time you have a suspicion of abuse or neglect you should certainly report it and you should not be afraid to do so if you report someone and it turns out that oh it was all a misunderstanding that's okay child protective services can work that out they do they do figure it out there is no problem in this country with them accidentally taking too many people away from the home <laughs> if anything there are many cases where uh, their intervention was required and they just didn't get to it. So don't feel that if you report someone that, you know, some cataclysmic thing is going to happen where um, a family will lose access to their child and it was all a big misunderstanding and that you feel somehow like it was all your fault because you called. That's, that, it doesn't work that way at all. Um, if anything, what could be cataclysmic is if there's abuse going on in the home and you had that nagging suspicion that feeling in the pit of your stomach and you didn't call and and it went undetected abuse and neglect is something that leaves um, you know long-lasting scars on people it has a major impact it's not something that folks can just kind of grow out of and put behind them and say well that didn't matter it really does matter and it has a very serious impact on people's lives so when you suspect abuse or neglect you should report it because it makes such a difference um, if there is something going on to have that stopped and um, and have the you know family working with someone so that they can stop that cycle of violence but also you have to report because you're a mandated reporter so that wraps up uh, what I have to tell you about abuse and neglect